Okay, this is the third part of our antibiotic susceptibility lecture. And we're now going to talk about another resistant group of organisms, and these are the extended spectrum beta-lactamases. We talked about these when we were talking about the Enterobacteriaceae family. So if you remember, what are our ESBLs? They're gram-negative bacilli that produce beta-lactamases. These are novel beta-lactamases that cause resistance to penicillins, astrianam, first, third, and fourth generation cephalosporins. The most common ESBL producers are E. coli and Klebsiella, but there are a few other Enterobacteriaceae members that can be an ESBL producer. Again, just like VRE, just like MRSA, the ESBL strains are not necessarily more virulent. They cause the same types of infections. They're just a little more difficult to treat. And again, just like MRSA and VRE, you can asymptomatically carry an extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing bacteria. So common infections caused by our ESBLs are urinary tract infections, which makes complete sense since E. coli is the number one urinary tract infection causing agent and Klebsiella comes in at a pretty close second or third. Wound infections, sepsis, and pneumonia. In order to detect your extended spectrum beta-lactamases, there is a screening test. So you can do a broth dilution test. And if you get a decreased susceptibility test, when you use a disc diffusion test to any five indicator drugs, so if you see decreased susceptibility in cephalopathy, Cephodoxime, ceftazidime, cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, or astrianam, it might be an indication of an ESBL. Or if your normal MIC in a broth dilution test for these drugs is a certain microgram per mil, and all of a sudden you see that it's going up by one microgram per mil then it might be indicating an extended spectrum beta-lactamase. So you always want to use more than one antimicrobial agent to screen for an ESBL. So the more antimicrobial agents you use, the higher the chance you're going to be able to find an ESBL. Now, of course, if you did a screening test, and you wouldn't manually do a screening test, you would use the results from the instrument. But if the instrument results are coming out to be a little bit odd, a little off, the MICs are a little higher than what they usually are for those antimicrobial agents, you'd want to do a confirmatory test to confirm if you actually have an ESBL. So extended spectrum beta-lactamase activity is inhibited by your beta-lactamase inhibitors, which we already talked to in our antibiotic lec talked about in our antibiotic lecture. And the beta-lactamase inhibitors include clavulanic acid, tazobactam, and sulbactam. So you can do a confirmatory test. So when you have a, a, let's say, a Klebsiella pneumoniae strain that is resistant to cefoxetine or ceftriaxone, and all of a sudden their activity is then restored when you add clavulanic acid or one of the beta-lactamase inhibitors, then that would be a confirmatory test that you do, in fact, have an ESBL.
So you get increase in your susceptibility when you use your cephalosporin drug along with the beta-lactamase inhibitor because the beta-lactamase inhibitor is going to inhibit the beta-lactamase activity produced by that ESBL organism. So in the lab, what you're going to report all ESBL producing bacteria must be reported as resistant to all of the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and as trianam. Now ESBL producing strains have variable susceptibilities to your aminoglycosides, your fluoroquinolones, and your trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So you would have to look at the test results for these to know if they're actually resistant or susceptible. But you'd want to really look at them and see what those numbers are. Now your carbapenems and your cefamycins will remain active against an extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organism. So your carbapenems are your imipenem, your meropenem, and your cefamycins are your cefoxetin and your cefotetin. So those are susceptible. So those can be used to treat an ESBL infection. So again, prevention and control, you want to hand wash between patients, change gloves between patients, proper disinfection of linens in a hospital setting, proper garbage disposal, daily surface infection, countertops, doorknobs, and cleaning and disinfection of all medical equipment, especially after it's been used for a patient. So treatment. You can use fourth generation antimicrobials, your carbapenem, your beta-lactamase as long as you have your inhibitor, your clavulanic acid, that's fine, your aminoglycosides, and your trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Most infections are cleared by the immune system and the length of time that an individual might be colonized with an ESBL is not really known and prophylactic treatment of carriers is not recommended whereas prophylactic treat treatment of carriers of MRSA in a healthcare setting is usually done. You usually want to treat people that are carriers for MRSA in a healthcare setting. It's because it's so easy. If you have MRSA on your nares and you are the type of person that wipes your nose a lot, you can very easily transmit your MRSA unknowingly, un not purposefully, to a very sick individual. So here is an ESBL disc diffusion Kirby Bauer based test. And these are the type of things you might see with an ESBL. Well, you see this zone of inhibition and when it's near an, um, your uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor next to a disc, you might see this strange non-circular zone of inhibition that might be indicative of an ESBL. So you can do a confirmatory disc diffusion, diffusion test with your, your ESBLs. So what you do is you would drop a ceftazidime disc as, and a cefotaxime disc, and then you would add clavulanic acid to each, a combo disc. So if you have a very small zone of inhibition around your ceftazidime and cefotaxime discs and you get an increase by 8 millimolar of ceftazidime and 6 millimolar of cefotaxime around your disc containing your um, beta-lactamase inhibitor, that would be indicative of the presence of an ESBL. So you're going to get a larger zone of inhibition with the disc containing the beta-lactamase inhibitor than you will in the disc without the beta-lactamase inhibitor. So in the case where you dropped your antibiotic, your ceftazidine and ceftazidime and your cefotaxime discs and you 
looked at you got less than a 5 millimolar increase of your zone of inhibition around the disc with the clavulanic acid or your beta-lactamase inhibitor, that would not be indicative of there being an ESBL because the clavulanic acid is not really offsetting the beta-lactamase. So only if you get larger than the 8 millimolar or 6 millimolar zone of inhibition when the clavulanic acid is added, you wouldn't, you know, in the case that it's greater, it's a ESBL. In the case that it's less than 5 millimolar millimeters larger, your zone, then that is not an ESBL producer. You can actually do your ESBL test using an E-test, and that would be what's um, more commonly used in the clinical laboratory. So what you have is on one side of this special E-test disc, it's an E-test specifically for, to test for an ESBL. You have your ceftazidime antibiotic gradient on one half of the strip. On the other half of the strip, you have your ceftazidine plus your clavulanic acid, your beta-lactamase inhibitor, in a gradient on the other side of the disc. If you get a larger elliptical zone around the side that has the beta-lactamase inhibitor than the side that doesn't, and you get a different number there, it means that that is an ESBL. The clavulanic acid is blocking the beta-lactamase production by the ESBL producing bacteria, and you're getting a larger zone of inhibition when the clavulanic acid is used. So the clavulanic acid reduces the MIC when you look at that gradient. So if you look at this, the clavulanic acid, the elliptical zone on the top, the TZL, has a MIC of 0.5. But the bottom of this E strip, the ceftazidine antibiotic alone, has an MIC of 16. So with the clavulanic acid, you greatly reduced the MIC, which means you have an ESBL. So now we're going to move to the last part of the antimicrobial susceptibility lecture.